Thanks everyone for coming today to our final Wingara for the year. Um, the theme for today is Connecting Health and Cultural Heritage and we're really lucky to have you with us today presenting the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Lands Council. And hello to everyone who's online as well across all the districts. Uh, welcome. But I'd like to invite Anne Ann Weldon to perform our Welcome to Country today for us. Anne Ann. Good afternoon, everybody. I made it here. I tell you what, that time of the year, whether it's, you think you're going to get through until the last day of this week. <laughs> <laughs> and I just love the transport in Sydney. It's beautiful there. <laughs> but it's amazing our gubbars. I know mean, there's plenty of you have left. But they've always got to dig and change things. Like digging roads and digging here and changing <laughs> this and changing that. And then you have fun trying to get from Dolly Jill into Redfern to get a train every day. Because they're digging holes in the ground and I'm afraid that they may cave in and we're all lost to the wild part of the world. <laughs> anyway, what I need to firstly make you aware of is that I am a Wiradjuri Koori Balam. And of course, I know that other Aboriginal people are here, and I just want to stir you all up to make you aware that Wiradjuri is the mightiest nation of Aboriginal <laughs> in this country, yeah? And Wiradjuri itself means the three river people. And of course, the three main rivers of our, our song line and our bloodline of Wiradjuri is the Murrumbidgee, um, the Lachlan, which has been renamed. Um, our traditional name is the Clear River, which has been renamed the Lachlan and the Womble, which has, um, of course, been renamed to Macquarie. See, that's what I mean about Gubbar's changing things, you know? They've got to leave to even change the names of our rivers. But, and perhaps that might be an initiative that uh, governments here in New South Wales can rename or take away the uh, English names and give it back to the rightful owners' names of, of the rivers, which is symbolic and certainly um, there is significant meaning in the name. And I belong to the Clear River people and I grew up in Irambi Aboriginal Reserve. Uh, I'm an elected board member of Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council and an elder of New South Wales um, Aboriginal Land Council and Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council. And a mother of three daughters and a grandmother of 11 beautiful grandchildren that range from the age of 26 to, to 5 and the 5 year old believes she's going on 25. So <laughs> she certainly, I mean you watch this face with that kid. <laughs> I uh, firstly uh, need to make you aware that this particular part of Eora country, uh, Metropolitan Local Library's Land Council is the cultural authority and custodian of culture, heritage, land and waterways. And I stand proud of my people's richness of our culture and indeed our strong resilience. I acknowledge of course all other Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal brothers and sisters here in the room this afternoon. Um, as many of you no doubt have come near and far to actually get here to this particular place. I acknowledge the owners on the land on which we gather, the Eora Nation and the Camaragal clan. For the Camaragal clan was one of 29 clan groups of the mighty Eora Nation. And I pay my respects to all elders past, present and indeed uh, emerging elders of tomorrow from our many Aboriginal nations across our land and express my deepest appreciation and realise that our elders certainly made a better future, uh, made many, many sacrifices rather to build a better future for us all. But we have survived, I hope, the worst of times and we will continue tending our sacred lands for the millennium to come. For my people, Aboriginal Australia, we have existed and belong to these lands that stretch us beyond 60,000 years as Aboriginal people, we know the tremendous importance of country. We come from it. And we are one of the richest and the oldest continuum cultures in the world. And we believe, or I believe, the teachings of our ancestors will light our way through our uncertain time, futures. We look to further our vision through the realisation of endeavours that protect our diverse cultures, our lands, our language, our emotional and our spiritual well-being, our ceremonial ways of prayer, and through our journeys, educate and nurture our children and grandchildren. For I learnt my Wiradjuri culture and traditions by the teaching and by listening to my elders. For my elders informed the truth from their lifelong experiences and the facts are seen through their eyes. And I call them our strong, clever ones. 
And as it were, Andrew Kurubala, I would like you. And of course, um, I didn't explain to you what uh, Balang is. Balang in my language is woman. I would like you to be proud and stand with us, to walk beside us. Please, please don't walk ahead of Aboriginal people. And allow us as Aboriginal people to share the world that our country has to offer. And it is doing this with us, instead of you making decisions for us, that will allow us to create our own pathways, build our own future, and certainly help heal, heal this country. For Metropolitan Lake Library's Land Council, we certainly promote a vision of working together as one community and to achieve as one community. And our boundary spans from the Hawkesbury to the north and the Pan to the west and the Georges River to the south. So as an elder and as a board member, but more importantly, with the permission of Metropolitan Lake Library's Land Council, I welcome you all here this afternoon to the land of the Eora Nation of the Camaragua people. And I also take this opportunity to thank New South Wales Ministry for Health. Um, and of course, Jerry. I mean, I remember Geraldine when she was a little bright eyed posse Italian Migo that used to work here. Yeah? <laughs> she started her and my daughter Paula actually worked here many, many years ago. Um, so it's wonderful to come back here and actually see uh, Geraldine uh, in the position that she's in. It's certainly been wonderful to observe from the sideline her journey and, of course, many other people that are here. I uh, have a lot of, I feel delighted that I've actually been asked to come here and uh, actually conduct a welcome at your Wingara Aboriginal um, Health Seminar Series, yeah? So, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm a living testament that, uh, you know, I'm a walking dead woman. Um, I certainly need to take at least every morning six tablets. Um, and three of them at night that have got to kick in. Um, but it, I have reached the age that I have because of that medication. Um, sadly, most of my family members died at a very young age. And in fact, one of my uncles had his first heart attack at 28 years of age. And when I grew up, I grew up, um, when my mother gave birth to me, it was in a segregated section of Cara District Hospital. And um, I mean, we weren't even classified as human beings of our own country at that particular point in time. And we used to receive rations from the mission manager. So they would line us up um, on a Saturday morning. You'd have to go over to the treatment room. And of course, they would check your head and you know, your eyes. And then they would give us these awful worm tablets and then would be issued with our supply of sheep dip. So that sheep dip was to sterilise and cleanse us as good Aboriginal people. So when I think back and reflect on what we had to live, the conditions we had to live under, it was absolutely horrendous. Um, that was here in Australia. That wasn't overseas. That was here in our country. And um, but it was through the fortitude of my forefathers, of my mother and of my father and my grandparents that have certainly allowed me to stand before you here today. And I know that uh, we've still got a long way to go, health-wise. Um, you know, I, I know that it would be challenging for you people that are actually employed in this area. But the key to it, the key to it, to us improving our wealth, is by listening and allowing Aboriginal people. Let us as Aboriginal people decide what we need to decide that is best for us instead of us being told what to do and how to do it. And, um, you know, you can do that through meaningful partnerships with Aboriginal people so that we then can ensure that our children and grandchildren, because I certainly know I've edu educated my children, but likewise, likewise with my grandchildren, because far too many of our people die too young. And uh, in this day and age, that shouldn't be the case. Um, and my sister died, which is only... Um, in the 50s of renal failure. Um, you know, so I, I thank you for allowing me to come here. And one thing um, that I also um, ask you to do is to remember our loved ones that have passed over before us, the incredible giants that have allowed each and every one of us to stand on their shoulders. 
the beautiful people sitting and standing beside you now, but more importantly, those gorgeous, precious ones that follow in our footsteps. So may my people's spirit walk and guide all of us as we continue on that journey together. And let that journey be one where you can certainly uh, develop meaningful partnerships with Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council because I know that under our present leadership, uh, we've got Nathan here today to do a um, presentation under Nathan's leadership as our CEO and Yvonne, my daughter, is the chair. We certainly have made um, and, and formed meaningful partnerships with other sectors of our community. So I ask you that if you certainly want to form a, a solid partnership, and I know that we've got some beautiful, I mean, there's some solid strategies that we have within our local land council that can certainly help us go forward with you. So once again, welcome to the land of the Euro Nation. Always was, always will be, Aboriginal land. Thank you very much. Thank you, Annie Ann, for your wonderful welcome to country and there's so many important messages in your welcome today. And um, I'd like to pay my acknowledgement to you also for the wonderful work that you have done over many, many years, being such a strong leader and advocate for Aboriginal people in New South Wales. And it's, you know, people like me that get to do the job that I do today because of people like you, so thank you. I'd also like to acknowledge the Camarable people of your nation, pay my respects to Elders past and present and emerging leaders, all of my Aboriginal colleagues here in the room today, Nani Ann, Nathan, uh, and all colleagues across the ministry who are here today and online as well. So we are very lucky to have with us today Nathan Moran, who's the CEO of the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Lands Council. And we've asked Nathan here today to present at our final Wingara because we thought it would be a really good way to sum up the year really and the Wingara series and all that we've been trying to do in the Centre for Aboriginal Health this year and for many years actually is about bringing culture to the work that we do and the, central, the centrality of culture in the work that we do in health and wellbeing and the importance of that. And we thought that the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Lands Council was a perfect way to, to end the year and to close off the series this year and bringing all of that together and hearing about the work that they do and also to share some of the local history and uh, stories from the local people of Gamaragal and Gadigal homes. Thank you. I'll hand over to you now, Nathan. Jeez, may I confess, uh, firstly, apologies if I um, don't get seen in the World Wide Web there. I'm conscious that we're being watched from, geez, from the Parkinji people and Barkinji peoples right up to Bundjalung country, down to Ewan country and out to Murrawari country, the northwest, the southwest, the northeast and the far southeast of the state is a pretty daunting thing to know that they're out there on the web watching me, so apologies for that. Firstly, may I start with saying Bajuri Gemrua, Gamaragal. Wingara simply means g'day. Welcome to Gamaragal country. More importantly, to be here today for the Wingara seminar. And I acknowledge the Centre for Aboriginal Health in arranging for me to come over today. And also, just as importantly, if not more, to get Anne to perform the welcome and acknowledgement to country to commence. I acknowledge and stand near today. My um, challenge is to try and do justice to the request that I've had today to talk about the role of the Land Council uh, particularly the role of the Land Council in health and wellbeing, culture and heritage protection, and to talk about the local history of the Gamaragal people. So I've prepared a PowerPoint. Feel free to get a, co uh, a copy of this sent to you uh, to assist to um, introduce the role of the Land Council. And so I should go back before the fingers start getting nervous and say to acknowledge the emblem and the symbol which you see on the PowerPoint that is really the logo of the Land Council. And it's got a deep bedded history in acknowledging the foundations of the Land Council. I'll speak about more depth very shortly about interconnectivity. But to acknowledge, of course, that's the mural that you see when you walk out of rail, the railway line at Redfern. When facing north directly to the city, that's the artwork that was famously painted in 1983. The 40,000 years is a long, long time. Some people refer to it as the 40,000 years mural. Certainly very proud to say that the Land Council adopted that as its logo in 1983 and very recently worked with the state government, the local Redfern train station group, to get the mural repainted again and it's back shining in its colour, just like you see there now. But that actually encompasses and represents many mergings that is the Land Council. 
In the centre is an art that is, of course, the rainbow serpent. Many may be able to see the link and the correlation between great creation stories of Australia. But also, in, in intrinsically within it, is different art forms. You see the dot art, the cross hatching, representing the great two differences of art in this country of freshwater and saltwater art. And to acknowledge, really, that's the backdrop of Metro Land Council. You see, Metro Land Council has a formal legislated role to play in the New South Wales Land Rights Act. It establishes our charter, our aims and our objectives and really sets out on which we uh, operate our business. But to point out our history, that formerly we've been around for over 30 years known as Metro Land Council, but for nearly 40 years our community known the Land Council to be Redfern Land Council when it first began as a voluntary council in the 1970s. And then in 1983 and 84, it took on the name Metro Land Council. So it's very important to point out that Metro Land Council represents the first births, the first starts of the National Land Rights Movement. It was founded in Redfern. Then acknowledging from a cultural context, the role that we do is to try and introduce those who haven't seen the colours and connectivity of the great island known as Australia to introduce it to people. But also to acknowledge that we displayed this map for the first time internationally in the year 2000 as part of the Olympics. This was at the entrance, the expo that was set aside by Metro Land Council to be part of the Olympics in the year 2000 to display the interconnectivity of all the First Nations peoples, cultures and languages of the Great Island of Australia. Apologies to the Tiwi and the Palawa who got cut off at the north and the top and the bottom. More pointedly for us as a local land council, it's all about mapping. Anyone who knows land rights knows you've got to stick within your boundary. I can't even fit our boundary into a slide to attest to you and that probably tells our history more. That we stretch from virtually right in the south corners in Bankstown, Bidjigal country. We extend all the way up to the north, up to Darkenjung country. But we also transition into Wanarua country in the far north northwestern corner. And in the northwestern corner we touch upon Wiradjuri country. Anne may have mentioned that little nation just west of us earlier. <coughs> Sorry, the largest nation I point out, that's an in-house joke. But to point out that Metro Land Council, we cover over 23 local government areas, four state government district areas, uh, tens of thousands of Aboriginal people, approximately near 16,000 according to the last census, but over two million non-Aboriginal people, or Gabas as they're commonly referred within our boundary. We are established under the Land Rights Act to preserve, promote and protect the culture and heritage of the area we look after. On the screen beside me is a list of just some of the names of the cultural groups that we look after. There is an internal uh, acknowledgement that you're better telling truth through satire and we say we look after the Gal Group and the Gal Group are sometimes referred to as the Eora Nation. And quite openly, everyone who ends in Gal belongs to or has an affinity to the greater group known as we recognise as the Eora. That's whether they're Bidjigal in the far southwest, Gadigal in the centre of the CBD where the penal colony was established, Gamaragal where you're standing, Burabaragal into the far northwestern areas, Garigal into the far northeastern areas, and all those in between that end in Gal. Gal being the word for collective, of course. But acknowledging uh, all of the different groups that make up the Eora Nation and also, as I mentioned, Darkenjung, Wanarua and Wiradjuri who are the cultural areas that we take care of, preserve and protect under land rights. The Act's very boring and bland in that it sets out, like all Acts, just straight out sections. And the relevant sections of the Land Rights Act is section 52, part 4, under culture and heritage, as I espouse, to preser preserve, protect and promote the culture and heritage within our boundary. The job that we perform daily uh, weekly, and as Anne alluded to earlier, when at the end of the year it seems like forever, but no it is. To acknowledge in perpetuity we hope to again take control of the four and a half thousand cultural sites that are registered today. But we acknowledge there's probably just as much if not ten times more that is not registered. And that's a huge challenge for us in working with the colonial government who wants to control our culture and heritage to say we can register it but it's still in your domain and under your control. That's quite a challenge because it's against everything of our ethos to maintain. The protection, preservation and control is to be done by our people. But unfortunately, we work through that reality that under 
National Parks and Wildlife Act, we actually have to work with them as the greater prevailing power. But working with them, we have four and a half thousand cultural sites. And when I say cultural sites, that is every encompassing part of culture, whether that's scar trees, burial sites, midden sites, or fantastic rock art that I'll show you a little, little, little bit about in a minute. But to stop on the rock art and tell you that Eora is the centre of rock art for the great island of Australia, it's the place where you see both types of rock art that you don't see in other parts of Australia, and that is engraved rock and also ochre painted rock. And it's right here in Eora country where it's famously maintained and the practitioning was centred. Acknowledging in the role of culture and protection, but it's probably ironic I put up this engraving now. Our greatest challenge is the protection of these sites. Acknowledging that they're in the domain of national parks, the majority of them, some are on private lands, very few and far between. In fact, less than 1% is on Aboriginal land owned and controlled by us. I'm proud to say one of the most esteemed cultural sites is on our land. But for this example you see behind me, beside me, is the whale spirit on the northern beaches of Sydney. I won't give away its exact location, but I'll say it's under great threat, not just from the rock that you can see breaking in the centre of the picture, but more, imper more importantly from government proposed projects. And that's where we get very saddened that our culture is not valued at the same level as a post office, as a colonial jail, as a colonial headpiece of sandstone. We think our rock, our sandstone, ironically, the same sediment in some cases, or granite, should be given at least the same acknowledgement in value. And in fact, we'd say it probably should have a little bit more higher value. If you look at people who embark on tours around the world to go to Michipachu or go to Egypt to try and look at old cultures, it's so sad to acknowledge we've got the oldest living culture right here, right now. And it's under threat from developments, uh, Dukans, Wamba, Narigar people, that is all the different words of the state for stupid people. <laughs> and also those who over love and over care our sites and sometimes forget to actually work through us or with us and do it without us. And that's where they re -ingroove. But there's certainly a major challenge in maintaining the culture and heritage. But that very site you're looking at recently had the New Zealand Maori come over for the Tahura whale exhibitions. That's the site they wanted to see along with a number of other sites attributed to our affinity with whales and particularly the relationship of the Eora people and the collective clans as keeping the place where whales were birthed and that is the Burrabira creation story or Sydney Harbour today. I touched on the other type of rock art and that's hand stenciled, ochre art. You may hopefully just see the hand stencil in the middle, right smack in the middle. What you may need to see, but is on the far left-hand corner of the picture, and that is where archaeologists, thieves or others have come across and stolen hand stencils. And that's occurred in the last five years. That site's on private land. That site's very vulnerable. Um, it has residential homes surrounding it. It's in the epicentre of, of Sydney's commercial districts. We hope that sites like that can be given value in the state government or others may choose to buy it back and allow it to be protected into the future. It's also aligned to a midden site, campfire, occupation site for the Bidjigal people without giving away its exact location. Another example of the role in culture and heritage was the recovery of this very fish hook you can see here. This fish hook was taken from Garrigal country just three and a half years ago in a project with Metro Land Council and Sydney Water in recovering some artefacts off a midden site that was threatened. Very proud to say that that fish hook now has formed the model that is now the monument for the Eora people that will be put up in, in Governor's House over on the other side in Gadigal country very soon. It was announced by Clover Moore on behalf of the City of Sydney, uh, New South Wales Government, to have a statue, a monument for the Eora people to represent that rich history of fishing. That's a fish hook, guys. Unfortunately, the, the bit that connects up the line or the twine has been snapped off right there where the arrow is. But to acknowledge that um, for us it's a great bit of big noting to say we know we were the first fishermen, that just proves it. But at the same time, that deep respect for us is to show we had comparable human systems to anyone on earth. I'm sure you all still want to go fishing today. We've been fishing for a long time, as that hook attests. 
In the role of culture and heritage, preservation, protection and promotion, it probably gets no more important, significant than trying to get renewal, acknowledgement and recording of our histories. That 10 years after the colony set up, within proverbially 150 metres from where the crow flies or an eagle flies, if you go direct from Government House, Macquarie's chair, we held a full-blown kippah in my language where I come from, as a Biripai and Fungati, a corroboree many call them, or ceremony for the majority, was a full-blown Eora ceremony. That very ceremony, as you can see in the picture, uh, was sketched and depicted by local artists was actually led by the, Gam the Gamrigal people. They were the leaders of the ceremony. And the irony that they came over and led that last full-blown ceremony in 1798 still remains for us. Also, I suppose, also the topography and the actual sketch, it's a little bit more clearer than the one you can see there, shows what's a beautiful landscape and manicured country that they maintained and prevailed over. In Changing up from the role that we play uh, outside of culture and heritage about health and well-being. That bit of art that you see on the screen is probably the most intrinsic history lesson for anyone about the history of Metro Land Council in the centre. Points of contact in history that shaped us and formed us to have what we have today. And that is the Metro Land Council being the MLAC in the middle. But I'd like to acknowledge the artist firstly, and a, and a very dear man in Uncle Ray, Vincent, who passed away, who bequeathed this artwork to us to tell the story of how the Land Council interconnects through history to today. All of the different movements that are known as collectively the Redfern community, land rights and the rights agendas. And acknowledging that down the bottom there's the date of 1788, one very key point in history and time, of course, for the Gadigal people. Of course, that being the establishment of the penal colony. Probably more pointed is the fact that Uncle Ray didn't mention 1883. Those who know history would attest that it has significance. But it's more significant in, in colonial history. That's when you locked us up, imprisoned us up and forced us onto concentration camps or what's known as reserves or missions. I remember in talk with Uncle Ray, I said to him, you didn't put the missions down. He said, what's good about that? Struck me straight away, how true. So he chose to leave out the mission and reserves and he jumped right up until 1938, which is right next to the Land Council. Those who aren't aware, you should be aware of the deep history that 1938 has for our people. It's the first national united protest in solidarity to call for rights for First Nations people or Aboriginal people, where we stood on the streets to call the day of mourning on the 150th anniversary of the penal colony that's today called Australia Day. Our old people absconded and broke the laws of the day to leave their reserves and missions to travel from places like Cumragunja, Victoria, from Queensland, South Australia and other places, hundreds and thousands of kilometres to converge on Sydney town to Eora country to stand together and say, in a collective way, we have rights. And they actually put together a 10-point plan, what we know to be the first 10-point plan or rights charted by First Nations people on earth formally to be put out to the penal colony or the invaders upon the land of which they'd taken. Great thing, and I'll show you some photos very shortly about that. But then acknowledging from 1938, the impact that that had certainly had an irreversible impact to say that certainly within one generation or thereabouts we'd seen 1967 and I note that Unc didn't put that on there either because that's not about our mob's triumph, that's about colonial county. What he points down to is 1972 and 1971 and as in his own words he said that's when we were alive with passion and we were, we were calling for the rights that our old people had put out in the Charter of 1938. And I'm proud that Anne's here today. She was one who was at the forefront of that very time. And all those Aboriginal elders, whether you're out there in the wide web, apologies, I can't see you, but I can feel you, to acknowledge that all of our old people, certainly Anne, my mother's age group and all their peers, the work that they did post-1967 up until 1971 and 72 
led to all of the circles that surrounds Metro Land Council. Whether that's the children's service and the right, or acknowledging that the legal service was probably the first founded community service. We have the medical service, and many more services that were established in the backyard that is known as Redfern. We're very proud to say, also to acknowledge that RAB had been playing rugby league permanently since the 1940s, is a strong part of our community's history. But it's more about the community controlled organisations. From the first legal services, children's services, medical services, preschools, church groups, men's groups, family services, the list goes on. But also embedded in this beautiful history is not just politics, it's the humanity of acknowledging social places like the Palms, the Clifton, definitely an Aboriginal social place. But the Palms was actually a much more deeper cultural connection from Aboriginal people to other ethnic people. And to attest the history of Redfern has a great ethnic history. That is, that in Redfern, you could be proud to be whatever you were, are and should be. Whether you were Chinese, Greek, Italian, Lebanese, Afghan, that's the place where people are able to be themselves. And it's the first time that First Nations people of Australia could dare I consume the word called hamburger, was tasted. Because we're allowed in the shop firstly, we weren't denied access, we weren't roped off into the Aboriginal section. Greek, Italian, Chinese and all the different beautiful ethnic people of Redfern allowed us in, open access, equity, equality. It was first realised in Redfern. So our community always acknowledges the important collective ethnic history of Redfern. That it's not just seen as an Aboriginal history, but also a great ethnic history. There's the working classes of Redfern. But also to point out the esteemed role of different things like the Black Theatre, which is over on the far side here. That it was through comedy, performing arts, that we were able to tell our stories, firstly, openly, without fear of being attacked or otherwise. And as you've probably hopefully seen, if you haven't, get on to ABC and have a look at the Black Theatre series that's been recently done in the last two years with Uncle Gary Foley, who was there with Anne and others in the heart of Redfern in 71 and 72, to get that history of how we use comedy, satire, theatre, to get our stories across. But that certainly had a huge role, the Black Theatre, and it's very much the place where land rights was born in that in 1977, the first open election of the New South Wales Land Council was held. And that ironically states that it's seven years prior, at least six, to funding being made available, formal legislation being passed, at the leadership of those old fellas who went ahead in 1977 and convened the State Land Council election. And that's on the back of 1976, losing the national land rights movement on the basis of the Commonwealth Government giving the NT, the Northern Territory Land Rights Act, that disseminated our national movement. But I'm so proud that our people didn't end, walk away, finish in a row, give up, they just returned home to base and formulated the New South Wales Land Rights Act. And as I stand here today, I'm in deep honour and respect to those old fellas because without them, we wouldn't have New South Wales land rights. We're the only state that has land rights. Northern Territory is a territory controlled by the Commonwealth. No state was able to find maturity, leadership or otherwise, maybe from our community, the call for land rights to actually have it happen. And I know I speak with a broken heart for my Murray brothers and sisters, Nungas, Nungars, and other brothers and sisters, be they Palawa or otherwise, who don't have land rights. They have no effective unified system like us. So as hard as it is in New South, we acknowledge we've got an advanced rights system, the most advanced system, which establishes us to improve, protect, and foster the best interests of all Aboriginal people in our council area. Which brings me to where do we do it from? If you don't know, that's us. We're the white-gated community of Redfern. Pardon the pun, it's the truth. If you walk past, there's a white gate that's just been the photos taken inside of. You'll see the emblem, the logo out the front, the flag flying, and I'm very proud to say a refurbished car park, thanks to a community partnership with Lendlease recently. It's all painted up and fresh again. We operate from 36 to 38 George Street, Redfern. We operate with $148,000 of guaranteed funding to service 16,000 Aboriginal people 
to look after 4,500 culture and heritage sites, to provide community benefits of funeral assistance, sponsorship, social housing and provide events. The grand total of assistance guaranteed is $148,000. It's about eight cents a blackfellow we worked it out one time at a board meeting. So I'd suggest it's a great success story that no one looks at and breaks down to a bottom line. How much do you get and what do you do? And the astoundedness of faces when they realise that is amazing. So I'm proud to say that our headquarters does everything from advocating the needs of our members and community, looking after the land claims and the assets that we've gained through land rights, and in some cases through successful applications to the Indigenous Land Corporation such as Elizabeth Street. But just to summarise, we've got some really beautiful land holdings at Elizabeth Street. The Day of Mourning site is now currently owned by us. We're the custodians of that very site where the protest took place in 1938. We own Skippy and we haven't cooked Skippy, we just look after the park where the TV set was filmed. We have a fantastic site that was bequeathed to us by non-Aboriginal people being Camp Wallamai, which is a great story of our community being led by Mum Shirl calling out for spaces for health and wellbeing in the 1980s. And it's still our plans to better establish Camp Wallamai for health and wellbeing facilities and I'll talk about that in a moment. But to share with you, that's the photo that was taken in the very hall that is 150 to 152 Elizabeth Street. The first ever known formal conference of Aboriginal people, with one special guest being the Prime Minister, Mr Lyon of the day. Notoriety has it that Mr Lyon joined us because he wanted to get the signature of one of the participants, because he could kick a bit of lever further than most people. That was Pastor Doug Nichols, everyone. Pastor Doug was such a deadly wizard with the AFL game, or Marngrook as our old people called it, that the Prime Minister just wanted his signature. And we're ensured that that's why he went, for no other reason than to meet Pastor Doug Nichols or Uncle Doug, as he was to us then. Um, it, it, it leaves us with a bit of a legacy that maybe through other means we can get people's attention. Certainly it worked that day. In land rights, uh, a greatest example is to give you, that's what you've probably seen in the 1970s, 80s, and maybe it finishes still late at night on pay TV. That's Skippy. That's a great example of a land claim, a successful land claim, where success is different for us to you. Success usually means it's a quick, easy win. For us, it's a hard win. You've got to get knocked back, get your refused land claim, then go to the Land Environment Court, appeal it, pay some lawyers, and then you win. And that unfortunately is about the goodness of the story because in land rights, when you get a transfer of an asset, that's what they transfer you. Dilapidated buildings, overgrown, roads decaying, infrastructure falling apart. That's the transfer of government assets under New South Wales land rights and the reality that we deal with every day with that $148,000. Some of the other uh, associated site next to Skippy looked like that when we got it in 2014. So they're the challenges that we have every day. And here's the challenge, but also the beautiful challenge to show you that's what Camp Wallamai looks like. Up top of it, surrounding it, is esteemed national parks, Darkenjung, Durick National Parks. We apologise for the academic name Durick, but we'll fix that one up later. But acknowledging that um, at least 2,500 cultural sites are around our Camp Wallamai site. It's at the top end of the McDonald River but it's also the place where the Land Council and the AMS is undertaking feasibility to establish health and wellbeing facilities, as well as drug and alcohol facilities to address our community's needs to overcome our health and wellbeing requirements. Unfortunately, I have to bore you because Land Councils like local governments and Department of Health and others, we have acts that require us to do things, but to confer. We have a requirement to have a business plan it's called a community land and business plan. Underneath that is the requirement to articulate all of the activities, aims and objectives of the council. And I can say to you today very proudly that number one on our plan is health and wellbeing and addressing health and wellbeing. Then cultural education, tourism and the protection of culture and heritage is the next two priorities for our council. In terms of the overarching areas that we cover, it's very important we acknowledge 
Uh, we border on to our brothers and sisters in the land rights movement with Dark and Jung Land Council in the north, La Perouse in the south and southeast, Darubin in the west, Gandangar in the southwest, and we have to acknowledge that we touch upon uh, Bathurst Local Land Council, Wanneroo Local Land Council in that far northwestern region. We cover what's known as the uh, rivers of the Georges, Hawkesbury, Lane Cove, Colo, Parramatta and Nepeans. National parks including the Harbour, Karingai Chase, Garrigal, Durick and Lane Cove. An extensive amount of beaches, particularly in the northern beaches areas from Manly right up to Palm. All of the harbours, islands. We've got some very significant cultural places, particularly in this case Aboriginal burial sites, repatriation sites at Reef Beach, Towler's Bay, the Quarantine Station, uh, Bujwa Bay, Maruta. Centred in our boundaries a number of tourist attractions, too many to name really. And again that quotation of how many cultural and heritage sites we have to look after in our boundary. But in closing I want to thank the Centre for Aboriginal Health for inviting me along here today and also to share with you the final component of what I was asked to do and that was to talk about the local history of the area we stand upon. The Gamaragal people. I recently had the privilege through Gab to come over and do a welcome to country and ironically I did it because Anne was sick. And I have to acknowledge I can't do half the style, let alone the colour that she brings or panache to a welcome. But I can bore you to death with detail. And what I'd like to share with you is that history records the Gamaragal people as the leaders of the resistance of Sydney, British penal colony known as Sydney today. For nearly 20 years, or in fact just on a quarter of a century, up till 1814, there was an area that was known as off limits to the penal colony. It's Gamaragal country, it's St Leonard's, it's the area you're standing upon today. There was such fear in the colony that when the first two <laughs> allocated new landholders came to the area, they run away very quickly. And I wish to acknowledge in saying that, that this is the country of esteemed leaders in the matriarchal society, Barangaroo, who's forever mis misrepresented as someone from the south with Barangaroo precinct in the wrong area, but she's actually from this part of the country. She's a Gamaragal woman. She was once a woman who had a boyfriend, or they might call him a husband, his name was Benelong. It wasn't the reverse. She's very famous for snapping the spears of Benelong when he chose to party and join the fleet and return to England. She snapped his spears. That's what's recorded in the colony's diary. Letting him know it's time for you to go. And by the way, don't bother coming back to me. She's also recorded as showing up in full regalia in traditional dress when asked to attend the governor's house for a ceremonial event. Benelong wore a suit and she wore her body paint and her ochre. So I acknowledge the power and esteem of Barangaroo. But also in the, in the patriarchal community of the Gamaragal was one of the most least known and recorded warriors of Australia's history. And his name was Mosquito. Mosquito was so deadly at what he did and his resistance that he led that he was actually transported to Palawa country. He was sent to Tasmania because of his deeds in the first 20 years of contact here in the colony, they completely picked him up and shanghaied him to a completely different area. And I pause on that and acknowledge that that's a bit of colonial policy and procedure across the globe. And I know that because in Gadigal country, Zulu chief David Sturman sits besides Cora Gooseberry in the unmarked graves of the coloured section of the first penal colony burial or cemetery. David Sturman was sent to Australia because he too, like Mosquito, scared the buggery out of the British colony so badly for over a decade that rather than knock him, kill him or hang him and create a martyr of him, for fear that his legacy could inspire others, they kidnapped him and sent him to Australia. We had the South African government find out two years ago and attend our office with great sadness, but also glee that they at least know where he landed now and where he is. But the same for us with Mosquito. Because only just last year, I attended the national gathering that was the gathering at Uluru. And it was in that meeting that I was able to talk to the Tasmanian Aboriginal Corporation CEO, Mr Michael Mansell, an esteemed Palawa man, to ask him 
Aunt, what do you know of a great Eora leader by the name of Mosquito? And his simple response was, Nev, I was waiting for someone to ask about him. He was that good, they sent him from us to Port Phillip and hung him. He's recorded as inspiring many Palawa resistance leaders, leading Palawa resistance leaders to show them how to resist the colonists. So unfortunately, acknowledging he's not been returned home as yet, and we still don't exactly know where Mosquito is, but you're standing on the lands of one of the best resistance leaders of the colony you've ever seen. And dare I say, maybe the world had seen. He was that good, they banished him. They wouldn't just kill him or take his life, because that would have left us with an indelible knowledge of where he was and who he was. So they chose the other path, what's known across the globe as the best way to silence, kill off leaders, movements, is to remove them without any knowledge of where they've gone. But I'd say to you, he inspires us today to keep the fight alive. And when reading currently archaeological reports who are recovering more and more diaries of local settlers, the fear of what the, Gamar the Gamaragal instilled in those first arrivers brings great glee to my spirit to know we fought damn hard and goes against a misnomer of history that says we didn't fight. And certainly I acknowledge as a child of 1974, the guna that I was taught in education, whether it was the 11 primary schools and high schools that I attended, from Balmain, Roselle, right up to Smithfield and Cairns and beyond, it was always that constant arrogance that we never fought. There was no evidence of us fighting for our land and that somehow that was a factor in the land being taken from us without recompense is not the truth. It's now being rewritten. So hopefully Mosquito will get his acknowledgement into the future. But I mentioned this earlier. The other esteemed role of the Gamaragal was leading ceremonies. I put up the picture of the last full ceremony of the Eora just on 10 years after the colony was established. And to acknowledge that two years after the colony was established, the most famous bit of history or first bit of history of good history between blackfellas and non-blackfellas in the country occurred. And that occurred over in Boorabarrigal land, and that's the beach just beyond here, just east of Nam, sorry, west of Namu, where the ferries arrived. The governor was speared. He was speared because he kidnapped Arabanu. And in history, we acknowledge that on the 25th of January, 1788, the governor wrote down the word manly when describing what he'd seen hanging on the beach on Canargal or Boorabarrigal country over on the manly beaches and northern beaches areas out to, out to Garrigal country. His report was they looked like they were six to four, six four to six foot five people with no body fat looking very intimidating. So he'd come up with the word manly. And that probably highlights the only good time we've heard a good word said about us, up until he got speared for kidnapping that very dude, Arabanu. And hopefully in history, Arabanu will have his history told and acknowledged. He was the unfortunate first kidnapping victim of the penal colony that was established in Sydney town. But acknowledging, also, Fenelong, I mentioned him earlier, he played a role in summoning the governor over to Manly Beach to make sure he got his reconciliation shown to him. And we say that openly, that only when we have true equity do we get to punish people for what they've done to us appropriately, do you feel fair or equal. And that's the only time in history that we've had a chance to spear someone on the basis of what he did to us. I'm more proud of the fact that no one got shot after he speared him. I think in some case he showed some dignity uh, in taking that spear and then not embarking. But of course, Unfortunately, history shows less than 20 years later there was a declaration of martial law against the First Nations of Sydney Town or Eora Country. So acknowledging the resistance of the Gamaragal people, acknowledging their esteemed wisdom and the fact that they kept ceremony is everything to us. And in closing, I'd like to acknowledge the Land Council's role in looking after not just Gamaragal Country but all the collective Gal group and re-emerging and trying to renew the culture to ensure that, as Anne, I loved how she touched on it earlier, we replace the English colonial names of our country. So I'd acknowledge that we look after Takora, to Darubin, to Yandi, and that is the names of the original rivers, be it the Georges River, the Takura, be it the Hastings, uh, sorry, put them in my one there, the Hawkesbury, to Darubin, or the Yandi, the Nepean rivers, that we get that cultural history back. It's at the forefront of our council 
Because we know you can't address health and wellbeing if you can't allow people to have identity, to realise their identity, let alone to practise their identity. And the only way we're going to do that is allow our culture to be returned without any challenge, without any hysteria. Uh, sorry to the historians, but we do call it a hysterical society. We need to remove that and allow us to be us, and then our health and wellbeing will be returned, but also acknowledging the vital importance of our environment. In our culture, we can't be healthy unless our environment is. And it's important to us that we rename the Cooks River to Woolai once more so it doesn't bear the names of foreigners or issues or matters that has no relevance to us. It returns to what it always was and always should be, a place of meaning and importance. Our culture is the oldest human culture on earth. Let's hope we can get over the tough seven generations we've experienced for 230 odd years and get it back again and just yeah, get on with it again. So again, thanks to everyone. Thanks to the Centre for Aboriginal Health, particularly Gab for organising me to come along. Uh, I'd like to throw it open to some questions and answers to finish it off and say thank you again. I reckon we should probably offer the mob out there in the World Wide Web if they should. I don't know who can help me with that one if they had some questions. But I'd especially acknowledge uh, all the Gurries, Gurries and Murrays and others who are on the World Wide Web watching this. Um, I'm very conscious of that. I acknowledge that um, I may be the CEO of Metro Land Council, but I'm also known in my community as the Honourable Member for the greatest metropolis of Australia. That's Telegraph Point, if you don't know it. <laughs> Telegraph Point's the capital of Australia. At least the capital for Virapais and Fungatis. It's halfway between Kempsey and Port Macquarie. It's the little township that I resided in. Uh, after my family left Burnbridge Reserve, and I acknowledge that as a Virapai and Fungati, uh, all of my people, uh, you may know them as people at Perfleet in Taree, Burnbridge in Kempsey, uh, Bellbrook, uh, or South West Rocks, or Rollins Plains in Port Macquarie, they're my old people. But also to acknowledge on my father's side, uh, all the way to Limerick, Omen O'Hurley, my father is Col Colin Robert O'Hurley, a famous yeah, family name from Ireland, who played an extraordinary sport called hurling, which I'll never play in my life. Is <laughs> so is there any questions from anyone out there while we try and get some from anyone else? In, anyone in the room? No questions, stupid or, or otherwise. Don't feel silly, uh, bad or confused. Anything is a question is good. It's about clarity and information. Well, maybe I've given you too much to digest and say, get a hold of that presentation that I've sent to you, and really openly, that if um, you don't happen to be in our land council boundary, still feel free to contact us. We can put you in contact with whatever local land council you're in the backyard of, whether it's Murrawari Land Council, um, whether it's Bedalla Land Council, whether it's Tweed Ed Lands Council, uh, you name it, there is a land council in every backyard of the state of New South Wales that can interconnect you with the community, the culture, the heritage, or the needs of whatever respective community. Um, and that's the beauty of having land rights, the interconnectivity. Um, Uncle Ray's talked about our connections within Redfern and our boundary, but I'd suggest that land rights gives us connections where I can, yeah, get a tough call from Val de Beer at Tipperborough, maybe Deborah Steed at Val Reynolds, maybe some of the Williams or, 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 or the Phillips family in Tweed Eds, or on the other side, Uncle Ozzy Cruz at Eden could ring me at any time to say, I heard you said something, Lauren, or nephew. And that's the beauty of having interconnection. So don't feel that you can't connect with us. There's an easy way to get a hold of us. Uh, feel free to drop me an email, telephone, or anything, and I'd love to help you out. Um, I was just wondering, and unfortunately I can't remember the name of it, but there was a book published recently about the peoples around Sydney Harbour, yeah. and I wondered if you know if that's a good one, like a good starting point. So, good question. Recent book on Aboriginal history of Sydney? Yes. So, we've got Coastal Sydney, uh, yes. there's Reflections of Coastal Sydney by an author known as Paul Irish. Mm -hmm. um, just... Uh, acknowledged Paul, does work with our land council, worked with us on the Aboriginal history of the 
collected Woolai or Slash Cooks River very recently. Um, yeah, a great book. But I'd say there's a number of books that are coming out about our history. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, Paul isn't an Aboriginal person. That's the only qualification we put on it. I prefer to acknowledge people like Uncle Bruce Pascoe in Right and Dark Emu, yeah. um, where it's by us, for us, about us. But acknowledging Paul's a great book. It takes it to a new level of research in the area of Sydney's uh, knowledge of Aboriginal histories. Paul's been able to pinpoint campsites that extended right up to the Domain in 1880, uh, where people were taken from the Domain to be relocated to La Perouse. But also the history of Continuum from 1788 right up to the rocks in 17 or 1840, where people were wound up, rounded up, tied up and taken to Maluga. Unfortunately, that history is now becoming more known, other than us sharing the history internally, that the original people of Sydney were all but taken from Sydney to be part of an experiment to be the missionaries of Australia. It was a conjoint movement of the local police and the missionaries to take us from Sydney town, transport us to Victoria and do some experiments called assimilation. And proud to say, but openly, some of the children and grandchildren of those people who were taken returned to Sydney at La Perouse back to Saltpan Creek as well. Mm -hmm. so. Great, thank you. But Val Attenborough is also one I put this all onto. Val Attenborough is probably the most extensive writer of Sydney history. Val Attenborough, the same as David Attenborough. Mm -hmm. uh, Val, awesome human being, beautiful human being. Put together the place names of Sydney, the aura place names of Sydney, and Val's an awesome person. Also helped us in telling the history of how stone axe heads have been traded from the McDonald Valley in our backyard all the way over to the Kimberleys and beyond and how the rock of Sydney is a very valued treasure and particularly granite. Yeah, stone axe heads. First thing is, they do know they're there, but I want to say, well done, you're getting out and having a look around. Um, acknowledging, firstly, but about the Karingai, the name, it's a sad misnomer that the Garingai people of the Barrington Tops came down for ceremony in 1828, <coughs> did a bit of fishing around the domain and then were misappropriated to become Karingai today. They're the Garingai people of the Barrington Tops, the neighbours of the Warramai and the Biripai, and it's a sad misnomer, but I'm more happy that you're out seeing sites, and particularly Terramadigal is the country over in that way. But there's a number of sites in national parks, I touched on earlier, the majority are, and they are recorded, they are known. Uh, they're just not given the what we would believe and perceive to be the appropriate respect, resource or commitment. Uh, it's a great tragedy to know that there's many sites that are exposed. Uh, but middens, middens are everywhere. We point out continually that it's a great example of our ongoing connection and existence in places. Uh, but middens are also sometimes used for burials, and that can be very sensitive for us, but the majority of them are on the coastal beach fringe parts, but they're a great preserver of bone and other sediments and calcium. So it's always with trepidation. We hope they're just a midden of refuse of tucker, and they're not as specifically used for any burial purpose, but you don't know unless you get the details. Uh, but hopefully one day our dream is to get all the national parks handed over to us and our unemployment problems will evaporate <coughs> overnight. And I could say that openly. My grandfather told me that in, in about 1980. We'd have no unemployment problems if they gave us the parks and the marines, the fisheries back. That's our job. Uh, we do have specialist skills that sometimes go into other areas, but the predominant role is in land maintenance, maintenance of our estates. And it's unfortunate... Um, National Parks are responsible for it, but um, we're happy to get in and let us know if you could send us an email and let us know if you think something's exposed or vulnerable or it's been damaged, because we want to get on to the local office of whatever respective range is looking after it to find out. Can we get some resources, some fencing or otherwise signage at least and get it up?
at least for 2018. But it was awesome. Thanks again. Look forward to 2019 working together with you. Keep up the seminars. Uh, we need to have more seminars discussion. I, I love what Ian said. Overcoming the disparity of our basic health. I lost a cousin at 34 to a major heart attack. And I'm very proud to say he broke all the stereotypes. He didn't drink, he didn't smoke, he was a first grade rugby league player. He lived his life off the ocean. He was an oyster farmer by trade. And no available explanation medically could be give us the example of why he died. And bless him, my cousin. It shattered me knowing that my cousin was the best example of living that I could have in my own family, my own direct first cousin. Uh, he, he didn't eat takeaway food, he only lived on that. But acknowledging that when he first started as a kid, the role that salt and sugar played in our diets. And the more that there's you know, science, research by health bodies, to talk to us about the horrible evilness that is salt and sugar. More information to our communities. Because I know recently there's studies on the link between salt and bone density. And I'm sure that's been at the heart of my grandparents and great-grandparents' disdain for rations, as Anne talked about. We were forcibly fed salt and sugar. And I think it's had a terrible outcome on our health. And it's coming out through the genes of our people a generation two or later. But more information, more work together, and hopefully one day we can all have a feed of passion fruit. Nah, that's introduced. <laughs> have, have a feed of, you know, barramundi if you're in the north. But for me, I, I just want to get more um, flathead. Oysters, pippies, uh, blueberries, you name it. Any, any type of local ingredient. We lived off it as kids. Even honeysuckle, that's enough to live off for a day as a child. Bit of water, butter, that's all you need. And unfortunately, we've got away from that. But if we can promote how good living is and just put a picture up of a black fella, maybe use the Thomas Dick collection where they took photos of my old people in 1920, we can show you what health he looks like. It was here in 1788, it was here in 1790. 